One of my biggest role models was my dad. Like many other kids my age, I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to drive big machines, work on cool computers, and explore everything the world had to offer. But unlike most other kids my age, my dad was in the military, which meant that he was deployed for eight months out of the year. As I'm sure you can imagine, this was a huge challenge for me. But not for the reasons you might expect. Although I did certainly miss him. He always made an effort to keep in contact as much as he could, and that was more than enough to quell my fears. No, my dad's absence presented an even bigger challenge. Who's going to fix the Wi-Fi? <laughs> Without another techie in the house, that left me, the budding cybersecurity consultant, to be the sole subject matter expert. Though I have plenty of fun memories from this period of my life, one in particular stands out. I must have been nine, maybe ten years old. I was writing an email to my dad while he was deployed. I don't recall exactly what I was writing about, but I do remember being right in the middle of choosing a crazy font color when the internet went down. I was terrified, like seriously concerned. I thought the 12 cat pictures I'd uploaded had caused some sort of, you know, cyber vortex that was going to crash the entire subflux mainframe. <laughs> I really didn't know what I was doing. But I did know I had to think quickly. If my mom came home to find out that I, Aiden, had single-handedly destroyed the entire internet, I would certainly be grounded. I tried rebooting the laptop, deleting the email, turning off the lights, but nothing worked. Until I plugged the modem and plugged it back in. <laughs> Bingo. Internet saved. Aided. No grounding. That's good news for me. Well, that was only a decade ago. Technology has advanced rapidly. So much so that I feel like it's every other day I hear about an exciting new innovation that, you know, like an AI model that writes like a human or you know, a device to detect earthquakes hours before they occur, or even a voice generator that sounds like Obama. <laughs> Furthermore, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the adoption of many of these new technologies into our daily lives, so much so that we may not even be able to go back to the way things were. Let's take working from home, for example. While originally intended to slow the spread of disease, the experiment has quickly turned into an expectation across all industries. The consulting firm McKinsey collected data that highlights some interesting trends, and you can see them on the graph there. Namely, 58% of employed Americans were able to work from home at least one day a week. That is a staggering shift, and it represents a nearly threefold increase in working from home opportunities since 2019. Furthermore, a, a study uh, conducted by the Pew Research Center suggested that attitudes towards an online working environment are also beginning to shift. Well, the study was conducted in 2020. The driving force behind working from home was to avoid exposure um, to you know, the disease. The shifting attitude, or sorry, uh, however, when asked that same question in 2022, two years after the pandemic, the majority listed increased productivity as the reality. This is why they were working from home. Um, and, you know, this is kind of the reality for many people. Working from home is the new normal. And it's not going to go away anytime soon. And while certainly important, the workers' preference isn't the only thing driving digital adoption. For many companies, going digital is a matter of survival. The increase in consumer demand for digital product offerings has skyrocketed. In North America alone, the adoption of partial or fully digitized goods has jumped from nearly 41% to 60 in less than four years. And that is staggering. In the Asia-Pacific region, this is even more so the case. The shift isn't even in just customer-facing business areas. Areas like R&D, supply chain, even manufacturing have had similar developments. Suffice to say, shifting workforce expectations an increased industry adoption suggests that the digital economy isn't going away anytime soon. In fact, the World Bank estimates that the digital economy contributes to more than 15% of global gross domestic product. And in the past decade, it has grown two and a half times faster than any other traditional service. And so, while it may not be going away anytime soon, the question remains, are we truly prepared for this transition? Are we capable of making such a shift in such a short period of time? But before we start speculating, I want to take a step back. I talk a little bit about how we got here in the first place. The internet, at least as we know it now, began in the early 90s. At this point in time, the early internet was sparsely populated and focused mo mostly, on, mostly sorry, on aggregating educational resources. Public adoption didn't really begin until about 1993, when the first web browser was introduced. While the early days of the internet was characterized mostly by text-based pages, technologies like HTML, JavaScript, and HTTP laid the groundwork for companies like Google and Amazon to revolutionize the way we interact with the web. This period of innovation and expansion is commonly referred to as Web 1.0. And powering all this growth was a technology called dial -up. 
And for those of us under 25, dial-up relies on phone lines to transmit data to the rest of the world. It didn't do it very quickly, mind you, but because early web pages were pretty small on average, it really wasn't much of an issue. It also had a notable benefit of not requiring any additional infrastructure. It communicated through solely through phone lines, which helped the field adoption. But as the web continued to grow, new technologies were introduced to meet consumer demand. By the mid-2000s, websites had been, become more interactive than ever before, and the speed required to use the internet effectively had skyrocketed. New technologies like smartphones and social media created new revenue pathways, further driving internet growth and adoption. Thus, Web, web 2.0 was born. And as I'm sure you can imagine, these new technologies required speeds that were just impossible over dialogue. Once antiquated text-based pages transitioned to a more modern layout, they required more resources and faster speeds to access. To solve this problem, a new technology was introduced, broadband. Unlike dial-up, broadband allowed for separate data streams to send data in parallel, which increased transmission efficiency. It was much, much faster. While broadband did require more significant investment in infrastructure, the speed difference was unrivaled, and the numerous quality of life changes helped to propel it to become the leading uh, internet technology of, by around 2004. 19 years later, broadband technology still remains the global standard for access to the web. Although the term broadband is expanded to encompass a variety of transmission mediums, the, the general concept remains the same. More channels, faster speed. The FCC, or the Federal Communications Commission, even went as far as to update the definition in 2015 to set the standard to be about 25 megabits a second and three megabits a second for download. Or upload, sorry. But with new technologies changing the way we work, the way we socialize, the way we shop, it's increasingly likely that we will be living in a world of digital privacy. And sure, not every technology is going to kickstart a revolution right away. Please don't buy NFTs. <laughs> but much like we saw that during the transition from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0, I don't think it's too far off the mark to expect a substantial increase in the need for faster, more reliable internet over the next few years. Which begs the question, are we truly prepared for what's to come? Do we truly have the infrastructure in place for such a dramatic shift? I mean, the answer is complicated. <laughs> While the FCC only technically requires about 25 megabits a second down, or to be considered broadband, the reality is you need much, much more than that. Let's say you're the statistically average American. You're married, living a middle-class lifestyle. Like many Americans, both you and your partner work from home to afford your lifestyle, and let's assume for now you don't have any kids. With this situation in mind, you know, 25 megabits a second is a bit in the lower end, but it's feasible. But now let's assume you have kids who maybe attend college online. I mean, aren't they going to need internet too? That's about another 10 to 15 megabits a second uh, that you're going to need for each of them. What about streaming devices? Music players, online gaming, smart devices. I mean, even our fridge can like tweet now, that's, that's wild. <laughs> These devices add up. And the more devices you add to the equation, the more bandwidth you need to support them. As you can probably imagine, the population hubs like you know, Seattle, San Diego, uh, New York are typically OK. You know, they have about 200 to 250 megabits a second internet, which all things considered is quite good. However, this is a very different story for rural areas. For many, the internet doesn't even meet the threshold to be called broadband. Take a look at this graph above. So the red areas indicate where it is a county where more than 75% of the inhabitants don't even have internet to be, you know, fast enough to be classified as broadband. Um, now here's that same map with an overlay highlighting areas where 25% or more of the population lives below the poverty threshold. Can you see the problem? I can, and if it's not immediately apparent, allow me to elaborate. Areas that have a high poverty rate are exponentially more likely to have low or limited access to broadband infrastructure. This is a huge problem. The lack of infrastructure will prevent vulnerable communities from adapting to the digital world as effectively as their peers. I mean, how can you be limitless if you're limited by your access to the internet? And this lack of access limits wealth building opportunities, education, communication, anything you can think of that you do online, you just can't do in areas like this. In fact, you can actually see a lot of these issues begin to take hold today. But if we take a look at that Pew Research study displayed earlier, you'll notice that those with high incomes reported the greatest satisfaction with work from home opportunities. Their low-income counterparts, on the other hand, reported less satisfaction with work from home, and this, despite actually desiring to do so. Suffice to say, the lack of reliable broadband infrastructure is a significant inhibitor of economic opportunities 
and low-income individuals are most vulnerable to it. Well, what can we do about it? <laughs> well, we kind of already are. Following the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, the United States federal government passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARRA, a stimulus act that comprised of the immediate goals of creating and saving jobs and spurring economic activity, while claiming to provide accountability and er, uh, transfer, transparency in spending. And over, of the over $800 billion uh, allocated in stimulus funds, 7.2 was detonated for expanding access to broadband infrastructure throughout the nation, but mainly in rural areas. By 2010, $4 billion of this fund had been distributed. And this is a lot, like a ton more than any previous fund, and it included funding specifically to support the issues that I highlighted earlier. So what went wrong? Why are we still having these issues today? I mean, should that have fixed it? To answer that question, let's take a step back and look at a report by the Government Accountability Office, or GAO. This office directly supports the U.S. citizens by providing transparent reports on the success or failure of government efforts. And in 2015, this organization took a retroactive look at the success of the ARRA and found some interesting results. While the report agreed that low broadband connectivity was an obstacle for these underserved communities, they found that the measures taken so far had been woefully inadequate. The report goes into far more detail, but I believe this notion is best illustrated with the following graph. As you can see, broadband adoption rate has increased across the board, which is generally a good thing. However, if you take a closer look, you'll notice that those same underserved communities are the ones who still don't have access to it. And in fact, the increase was pretty linear across the board. So what happened? The GAO found that while the program was well-intended and clearly articulated the benefits of broadband access, much of the progress was hampered by a lack of strategic vision and little oversight in the individual project's effectiveness. For example, if the program had identified the lack of computer education was a significant barrier for these communities, they could have made it an objective to get X amount of counties trained in computer skills and track that metric, which they did not do. The report argued that without a clear strategic vision and the means to measure progress, little was done to address the root cause of the problem. But where do we go from here, nearly 10 years after that, the, the fact? After all, digital infrastructure is, you know, the need for digital infrastructure has skyrocketed in the past few years, and clearly this demand isn't going away anytime soon. Well, the recent passing of the 2021 infrastructure bill seeks to address this problem. We've allocated nearly $42 billion to broadband infrastructure specifically, which once again is far, far more than anything else up until this point. And that's about 10 times more, actually, and it has the potential to give millions access to vital internet infrastructure. Which is all the more reason to get it right this time, right? It's no longer just an inconvenience to be without reliable access to the internet. It's a necessity. So what can we do? And not to be reductive, but what we really need to do is learn from the mistakes from the ARRA. Modern programs need to have a clear, measurable objective, and the means to track progress being made. And I, I know what you're thinking, that's, that's pretty big, but how can I do things on a small scale? How can I personally help? Well, it starts with getting involved in the discussion. It's our responsibility to make old lawmakers accountable for these goals. And to be honest, by being here right now, you're already on the right track. I hope over the course of my talk, you've learned maybe a little bit more about the importance of digital infrastructure. So take that knowledge to the polls. Vote for leaders that are digitally literate and share the same vision that you do. Another avenue to incorporate uh, would be you know, your existing advocacy chains. Each of us participates, you know, in some, some way or another advocating for something we believe in, so why not digital infrastructure? Feel strongly about equal access to health care? Well, great. Internet access to rural communities allows less expensive options. Care about economic growth? That's awesome. Broadband infrastructure development creates jobs and it uplifts poor rural communities. It's just a net positive for everyone involved, and, you know, the benefits cannot be understated. And one other thing you can do is just check out some existing resources in the digital infrastructure community. Learn more, find ways to get involved. Not all of these necessarily are specifically tailored towards broadband, but it's certainly a large point of discussion. And now there are plenty of resources out there, but I can personally recommend that Infrastructure Masons, the Digital Nomad Podcast, as a good starting point. Thank you all for your time.